Good evening, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Achyuth, and I'll be your moderator tonight. We are excited to welcome Dr. Matthew Anise as our speaker today. He will be discussing the process of building his first in-office lab. Before we get started, we have a few reminders for you. At any point during the webinar, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the webinar. Henry Schein is not offering any CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Anise, welcome, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Uh, the topic tonight is we're talking about launching in an office dental lab, um, kind of the best strategies to go with that. And just myself, I'm in the very beginning phase of that, so I'm going through the process myself. So it's been a lot of research time going into it, um, especially with the delays that I'm sure many of you are dealing with, um, with the whole COVID and work shortage. So um, let's get started. So perfect. So the next hour or so, we're gonna be covering the why, you know, what, chose, what prompted me to start the in-office dental lab. Um, you know, what factors I considered, you know, what was important to me and what ultimately led me to pull the trigger to start the office dental lab. Uh, we're going to briefly cover uh, the equipment needed for the complete digital in-office lab. Um, you know, I stress the digital aspect because what we're building here is, you know, the lab for the future. Um, there is almost no manual, no alginate, no stone, anything of the sort. Um, we're going to cover, we're not going to go a deep dive into the equipment, but just kind of a brief overall things to look for, things to consider when you're doing the research yourself. Uh, sort of the space setup and design, uh, a couple of important factors. Um, and then lastly, I'll show you my progress, where I'm at, my decisions, and you know what I chose, why I chose it, and some alternatives that, are, that I did consider. Um, and just a disclaimer there, um, you know, because of the you know, back orders um, in COVID and work shortages and just taking, you know, much longer for everything, uh, we're not even completely set up yet. You know, all the equipment's there, it just has to be assembled, which hopefully should be in the next month or so. So that's my fingers crossed. And then we're doing a Q&A at the end for any of your questions that you do have. So. A little bit about me. Um, I have two general practices uh, northwest of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, about 30 to 45 minutes you know, between the two. Um, they're both general practices, but myself, it, I focus more on implants and full arch all on four implant reconstructions. Um, that's kind of what I'm lim limiting myself to today or you know, in the future. Um, here's my family. There's my you know, two and a half month old. So I look a little tired. I uh, didn't get much sleep last night. So that should be the reason why. Um, but it's a full general practice, you know, profies, associates, hygiene. Um, but we definitely utilize a lot of the newest technology to create, you know, the best outcome for our patients. And we'll go a little bit deeper dive what the, those equipment are. Um, so. You know, the most important thing is to start with your why. Um, you may hear that about everything in life, but uh, you know, my why was, uh, the biggest thing was complete control, uh, especially during these full arch cases that we do. You know, we average about 10 to 15 a month as a general practitioner. So during COVID, in the beginning of the lockdowns, we would have fractures. We did the stackable guides, outsource it to a lab. And we would have people show up with fractures uh, right down the middle and it would be not restorable. And we would have to look at the person in the eye and be like, there's nothing we could do. We've tried to loot it three times, shattered four different other places. I've had to do a block temp with methylethacrylate, you know, spent two and a half hours doing that, which is, as you can imagine, not too fun, nor the order was that pleasant. Um, but it was issues or there was a fracture and the patient didn't tell us because it was their third fracture and they were sick of coming in. 
And then now you have lateral forces on implants. And you can imagine when I went to unscrew the multi-unit or the screw into the multi-unit, the whole implant came out and we were left with nothing. So that was kind of my catalyst into kind of venturing into getting complete control. There is an ROI aspect. Um, you know, the lab bill between both offices with crown bridge implants, full arch restorations, which you know typically get pricey. Um, 50 or they're easily over 50,000 a month uh, between both offices. You know, it's over $600,000 per year. Uh, so in my you know, calculations, you know, with 179 deductions with your CPA for purchasing capital equipment, you know, plus playing someone that's dedicated to the lab, plus, you know, charging, you could charge your associates, the lab fee, you know, would stay to your lab, it could become a separate entity. Uh, the, the, those are vertical growths that we're looking at, but I figured we could easily save money, have a tax write-off and have a lot more control in the process. So it seemed like a win-win-win all around. It also helped reduce the common errors outsourcing, um, shipping, lost cases, you know, turnaround time, you know, lost cases with deliveries, especially during the holidays, uh, lab shortages. I'm sure many of your labs have reached out to you saying that they were short staffed and you know everything was taking a week or two longer. Um, so it, it kind of eliminates a lot of those issues because it's within the same building. Um, it allows for more efficient scheduling. Um, how many times have you sat there and you're supposed to have checks and protocols for, you know, checking cases and then you go to deliver it that day and they can't find the case and it's delayed or it's held up or you know, there's an email with a question about it. Um, shade matching, it's right there. You can, it's not coming back five different times. Uh, more efficient denture workflow, more efficient, you know, kind of everything. And even same day delivery, obviously, that's something new with CEREC and such, but it still allows for more efficient scheduling, less chair time, you know, less overhead, less turning over chairs, which does equal more profitability. And at no point am I saying we're going to outsource or completely not use outside labs, um, you know, a set of cases, rehabilitations, high demanding fellows past fourth slim. We're not there yet. Um, you know, ideally we would like to be, but I still have labs that I use religiously for high set of cases where, you know, it's demanding cases, whether it be veneers or feldspathic porcelain or cutback layers. Um, you know, that's not what I'm comfortable with or nothing that we do, but we take basically everything else inside and then use them for the stuff they probably want to do as well. So a brief to start going into it, um, what is the equipment needed for a digital in-office lab? We're gonna to touch briefly in some options on each of these. So I'll just run through these pretty quickly. Now your CAD is your computer aided design. That's basically the workhorse of your digital in-office lab. Um, we have a dry mill, we have a wet mill, we have a dry and wet mill. You have your CAM, which is your computer aided manufacturing. That's really important how your CAD talks to your mill. Uh, your ovens for your materials. Um, the biggest thing and probably the most future growth is gonna be 3D printing. Um, we have a few of those, we'll touch on that shortly. Uh, finishing systems, how to make materials look good. Um, facial scanner, we'll touch on this briefly. I think again, going into the 3D realm, this is gonna be something really beneficial for you to have in your clinic or with your lab. Um, you have a lab bench, obviously, for the working space, desktop scanning, skin capabilities is a must. And then a lab tech, lab champion. So that was really important. We try to bring a lot of things in house. It was my assistants trying to find dedicated time and they would just be thrown into new situations that they have to go turn over sterility or they have an emergency patient or that help out hygiene. So I think having someone dedicated to the lab is almost a must. And again, we're doing the assumption that all the clinical part of the practice you know, does have digital control scanning. Um, here we're showing the trios, the meta, the CEREC on uh, prime scan. You know, there's many more scanners, like it's almost hard to keep up the care stream, but these are ones that just fit in. Um, a CBCT, um, it should be almost standard of care, um, especially with implant planning or labs. 
at this moment. And then a quality 2D care, a quality camera or 2D camera or a facial scanner too. So definitely photography um, is gonna help plan on cases, allow you to digitally design from the face outwards, which is a lot of more predictable outcomes and more patient satisfaction. Uh, so start with the first thing that we mentioned, your CAD. Um, this is the workhorse of your digital dentistry lab. So it's your computer-aided designs. So here are some of the big ones. You have ExoCAD, which is probably, you know, the 800-pound gorilla. You know, Trio's design studio is really big with dental labs. Those are two big ones. Uh, Blue Sky Plan, it's a free um, plan. Uh, it's a little bit more involved to get used to, but there's great educational programs. Um, Fast Designs with Glidewell. Mesh Mixer is completely free, um, has a robust platform, but it is a learning curve. Ceric by Serona, it's you know, the grandfather of it all, the direct milling in office solution. And Blender 2 is pretty similar to Mesh Mixer. The free, but really it's robust, but it has a quite steep learning curve. So your CAD, as we mentioned, is the center of the complete digital lab. It designs single crowns, aesthetic wax up, surgical guides, occlusal guards, dentures, bridges, bars, hybrids, custom abutments, you name it, you can design it. Uh, you print it, you can mill it, you, you can do whatever you'd like with it. Um, but again, what are the, some of the things to consider before choosing? Uh, it, you know, the cost, as we mentioned is a big factor. The add-ons, uh, the support, are there trainings involved or is it just you on YouTube you're using your dedicated time? Um, is it easily outsourced? Is it open source? It, these are kind of the big factors before you start choosing a cat to work with. Um, you know, is it something that can talk to your cam? Uh, they're all different factors between choosing what you want to do and then most importantly, your time. You know, how busy are you? Do you have time to sit there and dedicate to learning, you know, some of the free or less expensive softwares and dedicate that time? You know, that's more pers personal preference um, depending on where you are in your life, your practice. So those are all factors before, you know, deciding your CAD. And there's a few more, but these are the ones that really stood up to me and my decision when I chose my CAD. Um, so you chose your CAD and we're going to start going through the manufacturing process. So we're going to start with dry mills. These are some of the more popular mills. We have the Zircon Zon, we have the dry mill, we have the Xterra, and we have the Sara mill from Armin Gerbach. Um, so dry mills, dry is, as you can imagine, there is no water. Typically, this is going to be for your PMMA and your zirconia. Um, wax too, I, again, I don't do a lost wax technique, but, you know, dental labs will use them to uh, mill wax as well. So these are going to be your workhorses for full arch. If you're doing individual centered zirconia crowns that aren't Bruxer, um, this is, you know, kind of, again, I put four because this is all I could fit in a slide. If you were to Google dental mill dry mills, you could find a lot more. Uh, but these are some of the bigger players um, that we that most people have heard of or worked with. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have your wet mills. Um, you have your VHF V VHF V4. You have your Roland. You have your program mill. You have your Glidewell Fast Mill for the Bruxner. Um, again, there are more mills out there. I'm not saying it's limited to these ones. And these are going to be important for your. Glass ceramics, um, porcelain, uh, your tie based chromium cobalt, just because it has a cooling effect to these. And then if we keep going, then there's a combination of the wet and dry. You have your BHF5, you have your Plan Mecca, you have your Zurich, and then you have your Armin Garbrek Motion 2. Again, some of the bigger names, they are much more wet and dry, there's Ivoclar ones, there's a whole bunch, but again, going through, it's just some of the name brands that set up that you've probably seen or heard of in the past. So, you know, what, what are you considering when choosing a mill? You know, what, what, do you, what do you do in your office? What do you use it for? Do you want wet? Do you want dry? Do you want both? 
Um, some things to consider there are, you know, it's if you're going to go dry only, you know, that you can't do a glass ceramic. So typically you're not going to see day dentistry with an Emax or a Strauman Nice or something of the source. Um, if you do wet only, then you could use zirconia, but then the sludge from that is a difficult thing to clean up. If you do a dual wet and dry, it's the turnover between the two. It can be time costly, the amount of cleanup between the two. And if you have, you know, say, a zirconia hybrid milling, and then you have the same day, you, you won't be able to do that. You have to time machine appropriately, which, you know, some things happen spur of the moment. So these are factors to consider depending on your workflow, your material choice, of choice, the type of practice you do, the procedures you do. Um, another factor too is it is an open or closed system. Uh, can it talk to any CAD? Does it have to have its unique CAD? Do you have to be trained system? It's just kind of like a one flow system. Um, you, one that was brought to mind, I think to mind was Seric in the original, it was Seric only goes to Seric. They opened that up a little bit, but um, Armin Gerbach, I mean, uh, Zircon Zahn, sorry, is a pretty similar code system where they have their own CAD to their own mills. Um, so it's, or can they accept any CAD? Can it work with ExoCAD? Can it work with BlueCAD Bio? Can it work with any of those, or the three shape studio? The CAM software, that works with the mill. Um, again, this is the computer aided manufacturing. We're going to touch on that shortly. Uh, what what cam does it work with? Is it you know robust? Is it well supported? Is it or is it unique proprietary? Um, tool storage, auto changing. Some have auto changing tools. Some have manual changing. Some have a limit on the amount of tools, um, depending on the fine, what you're milling, what you're designing, what you're producing. Those are important factors to consider. Um, the disc, so typically zirconia, you're going to have in a disc. Uh, your abutment blanks, um, your block storage, if you're doing glass ceramics, is that changed automatically? Do you have to change manually? How many are stored? Again, these are all considerations. Before you choose you know, a mill, again, your practice volume, your practice material, these are all kind of tied in. Um, you know, the shape of the disc, you mean zirconia, it, is it a closed disc? So as you imagine, it's completely closed or is it a C-shape? Um, some things that they say for the C-shape, if you're doing kind of a full arch, it allows to have direct, you know, 90 degree access to the facial aspect, which could be a little more anatomically pleasing. Um, the axis of the burrs, you know, is it a two axis? Does it come, you know, it does it come just straighten at in peck, which has limitations. And you know, does it rotate? Does it come from a four axis or a five axis mill? You may hear those terms. Um, that just means which direction the burr is able to um, mill the given material that's in the mill. And then the size of the mill you know, is a factor, especially in general practices, if you're building it off in your office. The amount of space needed, um, additional needs such as electricity. Does it need a 240 volt instead of a 120? Do you have to get an electrician to put that in? Does it need direct air compression, uh, a water line hookup, or just an independent water? These are all factors that, okay, well, now you have to get outside contracting, additional cost, and you know, finding contractors for small jobs is not easy today, as you can all imagine. Um, and what does your CAD talk to your mill or how does your CAD talk to your mill? So again, we went to the design phase. We touched on those briefly. We touched on the mills. An important part is how does that design talk to your mill? So you have your CAM. So these are some of the bigger CAM softwares, Hyperdent, probably one of the biggest. Um, so this is basically a code, a G code sent to the mill that is going to kind of plan the direction of the burrs uh, for the most efficient, for the most accurate, and the most time, time efficient manner to mill your designs. So these are probably some of the most important but really unknown things um, when choosing a mill. So it's important to know what is 
talking to email and how to do your nesting and how to certainly design this. So, uh, and then you milled it. So even a glass ceramic, you're gonna have to go typically from a lithium disilicate, monosilicate to a lithium disilicate. Um, zirconia obviously is, is a really technique sensitive, really temperature sensitive sintering process. Um, there's multiple temperatures. It has to rise by certain degrees over certain periods of time. It can only go and fluctuate and has to have a long cooling period. Um, so it's really that you have a that, that you have a sintering oven that or a furnace that is really technique sensitive within those degrees. Um, you know, these are the to get uh, to Bayo, the Novux. And then you have your programmats, which are typically going to be for your, you know, lithium disilicates from Ivacar. So they're important to choose. Make sure you choose. You don't really want to cheap out, especially if you're doing more full arch, more zirconia, because excess heat, heating and cooling can cause shrinkage factors and instability, and your zirconias could not fit or they can fracture pretty easily. All right. So the Bigger thing that obviously the world of dentistry is going to is 3D printing. Um, again, some of the bigger names with the Form Labs, the Envision One, the Asiga, the Sprint Ray, and the Nextent. Um, you know, these are some of the probably bigger names. Um, doesn't mean that there aren't 100 more coming up. Um, it's kind of the wild, wild west, and it's amazing to see the amount of rapid growth. Um, that is happening in 3D printing. Um, you can probably sign up for any course that's gonna do a deeper dive, uh, but I'm a big advocate of getting a printer The costs are you know, pretty insignificant and what you can do with the resin technology that's coming out with the FDA approvals, with the R&Ds, it's pretty amazing. So what can you print? Uh, your models, uh, you can verify crown fits. If you're milling an office, you wanna double check. You can do clear aligner therapy, so progressive models that you do suck downs. Um, supposedly, you're going to be able just to print the aligners without the suck downs. Um, I've been hearing that rumor for about you know, three to four years. Uh, your digital wax up, so that you could do a silicone, so you don't have to send up for a lab and do all that. You just design your CAD, print the model print out a, so, and then do silica and suck down, and then you have your wax up in a side case. Your occlusal guards, you know, went from, you know, hundred dollars in a lab to a couple of dollars to print, um, easy to design. And, you know, a lot of them have AI design softwares where it's minimal design. Uh, surgical guides, implant placement, um, it's gonna be the standard of care. Uh, it's design them in, in print them in, and know exactly where your implant's gonna be prosthetically driven. Um, your denture bases and denture teeth, uh, so 3D printed dentures, eliminates a lot of the wax ups, the two week visits. Okay, here's my initial impression, here's my you know, wax bite, here's my try in, you know, each two weeks or a week apart. It's basically, you can 3D print your base wax and you can do your two to three steps with 3D printing. Uh, temporaries. So a lot of our bigger cases or full arch rehabs will do a just quick scan and we will print, have our lab in office lab tech print with that as a backup because if there's like a three month with extractions or with implants, it's inevitably going to break with a Luxentep, um, just happens. So we can just easily, okay, we have a backup temporary that we don't have to look for a party, we don't have to redo all that. We just reline a 3D temporary and it goes right in. Aesthetically, it looks a lot more pleasing. Um, so we do that. It's ideally gets to the same day, but it depends on the time, the chair efficiency, but at the same point, ideally we're gonna be just printing temporaries. Uh, your shell temporaries for your wax ups. Again, a set of cases, you can just make a hollow wax up and then just reline that the same day. Mock ups to you know cell treatment, it, it's, you can just put that into the patient's mouth and they can wear kind of like a snap on smile right over the teeth, wear it for a week just so they can see and you know they have a verified, you know, what the difference of a new smile will make in their life, and they're gonna be more likely to commit to treatment. Uh, temporary hybrids, that's been probably the biggest game changer for me personally. 
I'll show you some cases towards the end of the lecture, but um, yeah, it's using the digital workflow. Uh, we have hybrids printed. We deliver the same day on implants. And the good thing is any issues, we can just adapt. If it if fractures, we have one ready to go, backed up, stained glaze in 20, 30 minutes, and it can go in. Um, if they don't like the aesthetics, okay, let's make a tweak. We change the design. We print a new one. Here's a new one. Is we can dial in the perfect aesthetics. So that when it goes to zirconia vinyl or when it goes to crystal ultra or trilor or you know any of Hecton, then we know exactly what the final outcome will be, which is at least a lot more patient satisfaction. Um, I personally don't do this, but I've had friends. Uh, they print out the CBCT um, in the 3D resin and they plan their you know, zygomatic or pterygoid implants. So they know the path because I'm sure that visual is pretty difficult. There's a lot of reflection, a lot of blood, but so they plan it with a 3D printed model. So it helps with anatomical planning. You could do that with single implants, but I know a lot more for zygomatics that happens. I put permanent crowns in question marks because I know Formlabs has a quote unquote permanent crown resin. I, I just, I haven't used it. I don't know if it's there yet or if I personally don't, but I'm sure it's coming. It's probably only a matter of time. Uh, metal. Uh, I know there's uh, a company here right outside of Boston that I think it's desktop metal. I think they bought Envision that you know is 3D printing metal or soon to be. I'm, I'm sure the cost isn't there yet. Um, and then you know accessory components to the print. Um, you obviously need your wash. So after you print something, you need to get rid of the excess resin, um, and then. You need a curing that's specific to that resin type for a certain period of time. Um, those are kind of the two big accessory components with the print that you need to get. They usually come with a printer or, you know, there's ways. If you take 3D printing courses, they'll tell you the Amazon $99 hack. But, um, yeah, what do you look for in a 3D printer? You know, which one do you choose from? There's you know, probably, there's new ones coming to the market. It seems like... I would say monthly, um, you know, based on the 3D printing groups that are in social media or, or within forums. Um, so basically the big one is what type of printer it is. You have your SLA versus your DLP. You know, the SLA, you're typically going to associate with form labs. Your DLP, you're going to go with sprint ray. It's just the type of projection, the speed of print. Um, you know, there's differences in accuracy. But um, that's kind of the too big, okay, which one do I want to go down? The next is you're going to go your build pl uh, platform size. Um, your, that's the size of how many models or how many mouth guards or how many hybrids or how many temporary arches you can print on the platform of the tube. Um, so if you're a high volume, you kind of want to do your own ortho, you're going to want the biggest size platform because you're just printing models left and right. Um, if you're doing just one or two arches of temporary hybrids, you know, you care more about the accuracy and the fit versus the build platform because you're only doing one or two. Uh, your accuracy is going to be, you know, how accurate does it fit? What's the principle? What is the definition? Um, again, it varies for a generic model, not that accurate. Who cares? The best for your printing for something that's to be screwed into multi units using. You know, photogrammetry, that's uh, photogrammetry, that's going to be, you want the accuracy because that's going to be screwed into the patient's mouth for, you know, two to three months. Your print time, your layer thickness size. So the more layers it is to print, obviously it's going to be longer print time, but the more, the less, uh, the more layers, it's going to be more accurate. So you have to find that perfect balance where it's clinically acceptable. Um, importantly, is it open or is it a closed system? Um, you know, does it accept any resins and then they have those resins programmed or do you have to sit there and maneuver the settings of the printer to get the ideal resin? Can you only use that resin on that printer? Um, that is some issues that, you know, does exist in the 3D printing world. Uh, your resin selection, you know, what FDA approvals do they take? Um, what what are the clinical applications? What can you do with them? It, it, those are all 
important factors to consider when you consider a printer. And then, I mean, it's your, the ease of change of the resin. Do you have to wipe it down, pour it back into a bottle with a filter each time? How's the maintenance of the printer? Or do you just take a tray, put a new one in, and keep the tray stored? Uh, they're both different things that happen with a 3D printer. Um, you know, it's one can be more time consuming. It just adds to the weekly tasks of the person that's kind of running your in-office in a lab. And I put this as a question mark as photogrammetry. Um, I personally use it in the our office. It's really good for full arch and multiple implant restorations. Um, you may have seen these little dominoes or little flags on social media. Um, you have your PIP dental and you have your ICAM. So the difference is the same thing. So it's a more accurate way of stitching the multi-unit onto your digital scans. And this allows for a really precise implant fit. Is it needed? Um, there's studies saying with some of the new scan bodies that those fit just as accurately um, with proper scanning, good quality scanners. Uh, it's I We use it. It's work great. There's minimal you know, once you feel that screw go in and it just stops and fits and you don't get that creak that you have with a zirconia that's been back and forth with transfer jigs. Uh, it's been, you know, kind of a game changer for us personally, but it, it's, you know, is it absolutely necessary if you're doing full art? I think it's a really good thing to have, but, you know, multiple people get away with really good quality scans with scan bodies. So you printed it, you milled it, you've done, um, you know, whichever choice between the two, it's staining and glazing. So like I mentioned in the beginning, we don't do a cutback wear. We don't do, you know, hand stack porcelain. That's where we outsource our labs. You know, that's where we trust the lab techs, you know, CDTs, master lab technicians. They're still an important part in our practice and they probably will be for quite some time. Um, but these are, more for, okay, here's how we stain and glaze a monolithic. On the left is the Mio. Um, it's, those are zirconia monolithics that are just hand stained and glazed to look like a layer zirconia cut back and hand carved. Uh, aesthetically, they've looked great. Um, it's been a great addition. It's easy to do. It, there's multiple courses, some of the best you know, lab technicians I've seen will do a monolithic with just Mio. Um, you know, next we have the Anexet, you know, the Anexet pink, it's more for like a PMMA or it can be for like a printed restoration. Um, you know, so that's just, again, painted on, stained with a brush, cured. And then the OptiGlaze 2 is here on the far right. Again, just there's a denture just stained with the gum and then just stained on top, no cutback layering, no porcelain, anything like that, but you still get the same effect. So you still get the translucency, the body, the incisal, you have layers to it with just a glaze on top of that. So personally in our lab, in, in our in-office lab, we're using this. Um, we're not at the level to be doing the cutbacks and the porcelain stacking and you know, the life side press on top of a cutback UMAX. You see some of those restorations are absolutely beautiful. Uh, but you can get a very great result that you can control within your lab with some simple and staining glazing kits. And so these are just cases from my phone that we've done with 3D printed re resin and staining and glazing. Um, so these are just printed with the, um, with the, uh, with uh, the EDAM 100. And then we stay in with OptiGlaze typically with these. So cut back, so they you know, have good life, good color, good contrast, comes look good. And then they go in the patient's mouth. So it's basically print for 45 minutes, cure for you know 20, and then stain and glaze for about 30. So it really changes the way the whole full arch workflow goes. Um, actually today, this is the case we finished up today. I finished like an hour ago. We're still at the office now. So if you hear background noise, I apologize. Everyone's starting to leave and say goodbye. But you know, this this is what dual arcs. This was all these teeth are extracted, five implants place. This was an old stackable guide 
um, you know, temporary that was delivered. You can see how bulky it is. You can see just how high, unhygienic it is. You know, with the design, with the print, we were able to deliver this, you know, within two hours after surgery. So it's a huge game changer for us in kind of the work that we do here. Um, so just as 3D printing is getting big, uh, you know, photography is getting large. I mean, it's been big in cosmetic dentistry for full arch planning, for cosmetic planning from, you know, FGTP protocols of planning from the face outwards or face inwards. Um, I think the next big thing will be facial scanning. Um, so these are kind of the face scanners, the OB scanner and the H2 scanner. Um, you know, you can get digital articulation, you can plane, um, you can design, you can combine this with your um, CBCTs and intraoral scans, and then you have a full digital three-dimensional workflow, uh, kind of like a DSD, uh, full smile profile. It, it just takes in all the factors. I think this is where a lot of the full cosmetic aesthetic planning will be. Um, you can just fully do a digital workup from a facial scanner and you know a CBCT and an oral scanner, and then print that wax up in your office from the face outwards and you know, deliver a predictable great result to your patients. So it's, we are, I think they're getting installed in our office next month. It was supposed to be this month, but the flooring that was supposed to go with the lab was, uh, was back ordered in a shipping container for about, three extra months. So there was no flooring. So there was no CBCT. So then we didn't get the training. So, um, you know, this is still a continual growth for me. Like I still want to document this as much as possible and share as much as the struggles and trials and tribulations and successes that I do have. But again, I'm still in the infancy stage. Everything's been purchased. It's just not fully up and fully functional the way I want it to be you know, due to delays. Uh, and if you don't have an intraoral scanner, and even if you do, sometimes a desktop scanner is helpful. Um, so for some of our full arts, we'll still need to take like an alginate substitute or alginate on the patient. And sometimes there's teeth that are too long that we can't capture. Um, there's also, you know, it's too bloody and it's difficult to scan. You know, a desktop scanner is helpful even if you, and it's gonna be less costly than you investing into a intro system, even though the prices of those, you know, with the medit has come down pretty significantly, um, but it's something to potentially have if you don't wanna make the, if you still love your PVS or your polyethers and you're gonna stick with those no matter what, then it's good to be able to communicate with a lab directly with, you know, a desktop scanner. Um, even some CBCTs now will be able to substitute and become your desktop scanner plus a CBCT. So obviously a lab workbench, give your space. I mean, I feel bad for uh, you know my lab guy now because he's standing around. I'll show you some photos in just a moment of what I mean. But obviously air compression, you know, magnification, low light, uh, sandblasting, if not built in, or at least you can put it on top with a vacuum. Uh, those are kind of the big things. They're pretty you know, standard across the board. You know, here's some photos. Um, and a dedicated lab person. I just snuck a picture of my guy, Jonathan, you know, earlier today. Um, so, we have, you know, again, important for the CAD is going to be your computer. That's HP Omen. It's, you know, one of the most powerful computers out there for that you can purchase, you know, at, you know, Best Buy or whatnot. You know, he's doing a wax up on ExoCAD right there. Um, so just, I think having someone there in the beginning, we were doing, like I said, our assistants and they were just kind of pulled every which way within the clinic and things were just kind of not getting done or they'd have to stay late or then we sacrificed clinical care because especially finding people, you know, with a work shortage, um, you know, it's pretty difficult to find. So I think having someone that's okay in charge of all your surgical guides, is in charge of your wax ups, in charge of your Google guards, you know, in charge of staining, glazing, and printing the temporaries, talking to designers, being able to design. I think that's definitely something to grow around, and we're definitely growing together in this, um, you know, this whole new digital technology field and lab that we're building out. So where am I at? So these are photos, as you can see. Uh, it's still a work in progress. So this on the left was the storage of when I bought the practice. It was built out 12 years ago, cabinets everywhere, which I hate. 
Um, you know, a lot of this is getting ripped up. A lab bench is going to go right over here into the window. Um, we're going to we have our you know, Drew form for you know suck downs. Again, a lot of the time we can just 3D print a mouth guard. So it's you know just really for sports athletic guards. That's all we kind of use it for now. Or even you know quick short term aligners or retainers. Um, you know, it's a lot of this is going to go lab bench, open up, open shelving, 3D printing will live in this room. And I'll kind of explain why. Uh, there's our form two lab that we have. Um, there's the box of the pick, the um, you know, the pick scanner that we use for full arch. And then here you can see the X mill 500 that we purchased, the dry mill. It's still wrapped in paper because we're waiting for 240 volts that we didn't have in this area. Um, and air compression line. Um, it's going to be the cabinets are going in, in a few weeks by the end of the year. So this will be our you know centering and milling area. That's in a different room. That other room back is over back here in this corner because this can create a lot of dust. If you get dusty, and the last thing you want to get in your resin is dust to compromise print. So you're, you're printing and your milling should be kind of as far or in separate rooms as possible. So we have our dry mill and our wet mill is up here in this box. So again, we went with two different mills between the dry mill and the wet mill. The big reason why is because we're doing a lot of full arch zirconia or even single unit zirconia that we want to just mill in a pot and center in the oven. That's down here. We did not want to take that up from our wet mill to do you know, custom tie bases or we didn't want to do that from same day dentistry that could be planned or sprung upon us. Because like I said, our volume of doing full arches, you know, there's 10 to 12 a month, they do take a little bit to mill or even zirconia crowns, you know, 30, 40 crowns a month. That could be zirconia, probably half will go to Emacs. But <clears throat> it's the practitioner's preference and we'll see how that goes. But I wanted to have both options to be able to do the same day um, and not tie up and switch and have to turn over the mill. Um, our zirconia oven is down here. Again, it's not something that you should cheap out on because it will determine the final outcome of your zirconia. Um, here is his workstation. This is all, we're in the middle of a remodel. So all the boxes have been moved there. This is all gonna be brand new cabinetry. Here's our Envision One. Here's our hot dog roller. So our resin has to be in constant motion. So the Flexera. So we just rotated on the hot dog roller. Um, we bought that which is on Amazon. Uh, just design studio. So this will be all brand new. This will be kind of just our CAD design, you know, kind of touch-ups will kind of happen here. There's this lab bench and boxes. You can see the little drawer. It's next to the uh, our sedation cart that we use um, that's stored out back. So there is a lab bench, it just hasn't been assembled because we're waiting for the demolition in the lab. Um, here's our sprint ready 55. Again, we chose the 55 because we're doing a lot more um, you know, hybrids, a little bit more accuracy. I think you can still do it on the 95, um, but veneers, temporaries, uh, a little bit more for like the full rehab or full aesthetic or full arch sort of lab. Um, so like I said, <laughs> everything's still in boxes and stages. Uh, it should be up in a month or two. Uh, it was supposed to be done three months ago, but um, everything is just taking forever. Um, the ADEC chairs we ordered in June, I think are coming in February, which holds up the contractors, which holds up the electrician, which is just, it's been just a snowball of effects. But, you know, if you want to keep following me on the process, uh, Instagram's right there. Questions that you have specifically, that's, you know, my personal email. Uh, text, cell phone is right there, so don't hesitate. I'm not the best person to respond to text. Email is usually best, but, you know, I try my best. And... Time for Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Anise. Uh, we're gonna open up for the Q&A. So as a reminder to everyone, able to submit your questions using the Q&A section within the Zoom control pad. And Dr. Anise, uh, as the presentation was going, we had some comments. Uh, we had one from Robert. Uh, he said, fantastic information with the front running approach. Right. One of our questions is, for uh, someone who wants to ultimately do dentures, what 3D printer do you recommend? Uh, I know a lot of them have the form labs 
it's not an immediate that you need to have the resin done immediately. I know the F, the Form Labs 3D or the, even the Form 2 both have denture resin. Um, so does the Envision, so does Sprint Ray. I think all of them could eventually, uh, they all do dentures, I know that. So it depends on you know what you're specifically looking for as far as other capabilities. Um, you know, it's basically the type of resin that, that's something to look into. Uh, but they're all capable at this point to print 3D dentures. So it comes down to costs, what additional things you can do with the 3D printer. I wouldn't just type into a single, uh, just a single procedure. I would sit there and what else can you do for me? Um, is it open source? Um, you know, is it good support? Is there a good wrap? I think those are kind of more factors because ultimately all the resins and you can interchange resins if there's a better resin from you know Keystone or anything like that. So I wouldn't just choose it based on one procedure personally. Thank you, doctor. Uh, our next question is from Adam and he wanted to know, which of the printers have you heard is the most accurate of what you had presented? Most accurate, you're gonna have, so your SLAs are typically gonna be more accurate than your DLPs um, from you know what I've gathered or heard, but then is that increasing accuracy gonna be worth the offset in, in time. So with I do, we do the same day sort of printed 3D temporaries and hybrids. So we do that, it's, it doesn't have to be the absolutely most accurate. It has to be accurate enough to fit with a passive fit, but also be able to print within you know 45 minutes or so, which happens more the DLP, which is why we went for you know, the Sprint Ray 55 and why we went to you know, the uh, Envision 1. Um, but these are getting more and more accurate across even some of the lesser beans like the frozen and some of the other resins. So it's, it's each one is getting more accurate as we go. There's no just, okay, this is the king of the king of accuracy. I don't believe so, at least. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have a question from Philip, and he wanted to know if you had any experience using Pecton or Peak due to its flexibility versus zir zirconia. I've had pectoral restoration. I've done one. I haven't milled personally. Um, I know it's, I use mostly zirconia or I'll use like crystal ultra trilor. Um, it's there. I've heard of it. It's just something that, you know, we stick to what we've used. Um, you know, there's probably some things with pecton. Um, I just personally stick with zirconia or we just stick with crystal ultra or trilor. Uh, but, you know, there's adaptive changes in every single resin. Um, I know it's supposed to be a lot more forgiving, a lot more flexibility. Um, so it's something definitely to explore as we grow this mill. Okay, now we got comfortable milling. Let's try milling both, you know, zirconia and the pecton and peak and see which we like best. But we're starting currently with zirconia and then going from there. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have another question uh, regarding the hardware. Uh, they wanted to know what computer did you say was the best for the lab use? Um, it's basically just processing power. Um, we got the, it's the HP, anything that has the solid state graphic card has, it's you just want a high end gaming tower, basically. Anything that can do high end gaming capabilities, typically around two, fifteen hundred to three to four thousand dollars, is going to give you, you know, really dynamic. Processing speeds for design, um, same thing with that you would use for if you were to buy your own laptop or tower for intraoral scanning. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have another question and they wanted to know, have you explored dynamic navigation or YOMI robotics? Yomi, um, I actually have a meeting with them on Wednesday at the office, um, just to explore. I have had a colleague and person I graduated, neural surgeon with, um, in Philly that graduated dental school with, he uses it. Yeah, so I'm getting a demonstration actually on Wednesday, my office next week. Next week. Thank you, doctor. We have a comprehensive question here. Uh, they wanted to know how long would you say it takes to design temporaries and software? And then as a follow-up, 
uh, they wanted to know, you had mentioned 45 minutes for the DLP printers to print. How long for the SLA? I think SLA is still too, it's, they're saying it's faster. I have the Form 2. So it's an older SLA. It's not the Form 3B, which is supposed to be faster, but they're, they're not going to be anywhere near as fast as the DLP, but they're supposed to have less processing time. But they said they'll cut the time down i still think it's gonna be like an hour and a half to two and a half hours depending on the printer um you know that's with aggressive speed again with these printers you're gonna have you can choose your settings on layer thickness which you know if you go for a thicker layer there's gonna be less accuracy which will increase your speed so it's obviously with an sla you have a single layer that just goes across versus a dlp is so just a projection layer projection layer which is why the speed is so much faster. But then the SLA, because it's going single layer as it goes with the laser, um, it's gonna be more accurate for sure. Thank you, doctor. And then uh, we have another question and they uh, wanted so to know- I think they wanted to review the workflow the same day. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, so basically a lot of it happens in the planning phase. Uh, so we take photos, we take CBCT, we take internal records. Uh, we have a design ready to go. Um, we just base on the, okay, this is what our ideal design is. And then, you know, day of surgery, we place the implants based on the ideal design. Uh, we do a scan. Uh, we do photogrammetry uh, or photogrammetry. And we, you know, combine those um, to get really precise placement. And then we combine that with our initial design, uh, merge all those together. You know, 30, 40 minutes, 30 minutes for a single arch. So it prints in 45, um, you know, finish thing, finish process 20, stain glaze, you know, 20, 25. So that's basically start to finish. Yes, thank you, doctor. Uh, another question we had was, did your milk company help you with learning ExoCAD or did you utilize an educational source like Exo Academy? So there's, I mean, ExoCAD definitely has probably the most a wide variety of training. Um, typically, it's not your mill company. Your mill company doesn't really care about your CAD. They care more about your CAM, uh, as long as it's open source. So when you purchase your CAD, so if you do purchase ExoCAD, then you know they're typically going to provide the support, the training. Um, you know, there's, yeah, like you said, Exo Academy. There's Evolve, there's Transcend, there's so many that have involvement with ExoCAD. Um, so typically the supplier that you purchase your ExoCAD from, CADRAY, um, you know, they will provide training. There's courses that can do a lot of ExoCAD training. You know, Ex ExoCAD is probably by far the biggest you know, CAD designer for sure. Thank you, doctor. I think this might be our last question. Acosta yeah. wanted to know, which printer are you using for same day full arch cases? So I am currently using the EDET, the EDET, uh, the Envision Tech One with the EDET 100 or the Flexera resin. I have the Sprint Ray. So there's two locations. I have one. I have the Envision Tech One in one office. I have the Sprint Ray 55 in the other. The issue with the other one, why we're not printing there, is we're waiting for the On X resin, which is their FDA approved. Um, you know, full arc, same day approved resin that's you know, reinforced. It just uh, it's supposed to get in October. I think they're just, you know, this crazy demand. So I think it's coming, I think a week or two, I was promised. So the arches that I do in that office, I'm going to compare the sprint ray. Um, you know, I have colleagues that use it that have had great results and, you know, love the results. But currently it's going to be the Envision one with the Flex Era that I'm using. Thank you, doctor. We did have a couple of questions coming in about ExoCAD, if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, firstly, they wanted to know how expensive is ExoCAD? So it depends on what you get for a bundle. Uh, there's additional add-ons. You know, one thing I didn't mention is, you know, is it, do you buy it and then it's full service or is there just, you have to pay for add-on? ExoCAD does have a lot of add-ons. So there's ExoCAD plan, Exo full. It's a little different you know, facial scanning capabilities. There's a lot of things that you just add on to ExoCAD. You know, it could be, you know, low end five-ish thousand, high end 10-ish thousand, depending on what you're trying to use it for. Uh, thank you, doctor. Plus, and then our- yearly, I forget the yearly, there's like a yearly renewal that you know, goes through your supplier. 
And then uh, our second Exocad question was, uh, if you had any thoughts on 3Shape, the software versus Exocad. Yeah, so 3Shape, um, it could be, if you're using a Trios and you have it built in, you know, it's definitely a great workflow. Is it as robust as Exocad to do everything? I don't really think so, but I know a lot of labs use the three shape in my software. I have a three shape and I still export to Exocad. Um, I haven't had too much experience with the three shape software. We're having issues getting it off of the scanning tower and onto our design PC. We've been working on that with um, you know three shape to sit there and move the license over. Um, so. Once I had more experience on that, I could definitely provide feedback on that. I just, at the moment, it's been mostly ExoCAD um, that we've been utilizing, or even like Blue Sky Plan, you know, for surgical guides, because it's pretty simple. Thank you, Doctor. And I think this is our wrap up question. Our final yeah. question is How much does it cost to set up an in office lab? So, that again, a lot of this base is based on the equipment you select and what you choose. And again, to find out, is it worth, what is your lab bill per month? What are you sending out? What is the type of dentistry you do? I would say, I mean, just rough numbers, you know, say Exocad 10 grand, computer three, printer 10, uh, mill, you could do a wet and dry from rolling for about 50 combined. And if you already have a neutral scanner, I mean, you could be in for 100 to 150 with a dry mill with a dedicated wet mill, um, you know, with, they, there's, you can be in for about 150 for an open source, full design, full capable, 3D printing, wet, dry, computer, center, oven, I'd say probably, you know, top end 150. Um, you know, there's other closed systems that you'd be 180, 190. Um, but, you know, if you spread that out, if you take the capital depreciation, if that allows you to have control, is that if that decreases your lab bill? If that allows you to create a separate corporation that is your lab that you can charge your product, there's a lot of other benefits than just what's the cost and you know what is the return. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you for answering everyone's questions uh, in great detail. If anyone has outstanding questions, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording of this webinar via email in the next week. Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Have a good evening, everybody. Right. Thank I'm you, Doctor. Thanks.